today. We're going to turn on our webcam just for a minute so you can hopefully see our faces just while we say hi. Um, so hopefully you can see us there today. And before we start, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we are broadcasting this webinar from today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay our respects to elders, both past and present of the Eora Nation, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people participating in the webinar today. So my name is Natalie. I'm from the Community Legal Education Branch here at Legal Aid New South Wales. And I'm here today with Prue and Rory, and I'll just ask them to introduce themselves briefly. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar. My name's Prue Gregory, and I'm the Principal Lawyer from No More. I've been with No More since July 2013, when we first turned on our phones, and I'm very proud to head up a multidisciplinary team where the client is the focus of the work that we do. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. My name's Rory. I'm the Regional Client Service Manager within our Sydney office. I've been with No More since 2014. Um, prior to this role, I was in a counselling role uh, with No More throughout the duration of the Royal Commission. Thanks, Rory. And Prue. <laughs> so as you can see on our screen, uh, the title is Beyond the Royal Commission. And just to be clear with the uh, current media, we're not talking about banking or in <laughs> fact, aged care today, the Royal Commission we are talking about is the one into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. And as you can also see on the title, the webinar is for community workers. So it's part of our, our Law for Community Workers program here at Legal Aid New South Wales. And our, our aim is to let community workers know about different legal topics and what's new in the law so that you can help the people you support. And I guess the the National Redress Scheme that we'll be talking about today is fairly new and there's lots of information uh, for community workers to know about to help the people they support. So that's what we will be uh, talking about today. And just, um, I guess something we need to be clear about is the information we're giving today is not specific legal advice, it's just legal information, but we will be certainly telling you where you can go for, for free confidential legal advice through No More. All right, so we're going to turn off the webcam now. Just wanted you to put some uh, faces to the voices you'll be hearing today, but now um, we'll focus on now content and presentation and slides. So we'll say uh, bye to our faces and we'll get on with the webinar. So thank you. All right. Just a... a quick word on safety today. What we are talking about is a difficult subject matter and we want everyone to feel safe. If what we're talking about is too difficult for anyone at any time, feel free to have a break, log off and remember that it is being recorded so you can come back to it later. So thanks, just wanted to make that very clear. Um, this is a brief outline of what we will be talking about today. So we're going to mention, I guess, the Royal Commission just to put into context um, No More and the National Redress Scheme. Then some details about the National Redress Scheme. So who can apply? What does the scheme offer? The situation for people in prison is something we've um, got a lot of questions about. So we'll clarify that. Um, redress nominees is important because that might be relevant at, for you as community workers. And we'll also talk about the implications of payment and the other options available. And of course, we'll let you all know about No More Legal Service, what, um, what you can provide. And we'll give some tips for, for community and support workers as usual about how you can best help. Um, I mentioned we're going to be doing some polls and we're going to do a quick practice of a poll now. So you can see on your screen, there are um, some options. You can choose more than one. And the question is, have you heard of? So we just want to know as a baseline, what have people heard of today? Have you heard about the Royal Commission? Have you heard about the National Redress Scheme? I would say probably yes, given that's very uh, prominent in the media right now. Um, 
Have you heard of the No More Legal Service? Or maybe you haven't heard of any of these things, but you want to find out more, or maybe it's all new. So I'll just stop that poll there and we can share those answers. There's still a few people answering, but I think that's great. And I'll share those answers. So Prue and Rory, what we have is 92% uh, of people have heard about the Royal Commission. 84% um, of people with the National Address Scheme, 46% of people have heard about No More. So this is a really good forum to let um, community workers know about your service. Um, and a lot of people have heard, but they want to find out more. Thank you. So, That's fabulous information. Yes, that's great. And um, now, as I said, so thanks for participating in that poll. And you are all very good at using the polls, which is handy because we'll do a few more. So I mentioned we'll be focusing on the National Redress Scheme today, but just to put that in context and to, to talk about, to introduce the National Redress Scheme and also no more, we'll just briefly talk about the Royal Commission first. So I might ask you, Prue, to briefly explain what this Royal Commission was about, when it happened and how no more fitted into the, this process. Sure, thanks Natalie. As you've probably been watching the news over the last 24 hours, Julia Gillard was given a standing ovation every time she appeared anywhere near a, a politician yesterday. Um, and, and this Royal Commission is singularly um, to be, the accolades go to her for setting this up. And that was, she announced the Royal Commission in November 2012 as a result of a lot of pressure that was coming from various organisations. Um, the Commission itself started early in 2013 and the idea was to not so much look at um, institutional child sexual abuse but to look at the institutional responses to that and I think that was probably clear in the apology yesterday. It was the institutions that failed the children that they, the Royal Commission was looking into. The Royal Commission was unique in that it was made up of of thirds, so we, we were thinking of it in terms of, yes, the public hearings that we saw on our news each night, the research arm, which was going on and has provided just incredible background information and ongoing information for all workers working in this space. And then uniquely to this Royal Commission, private sessions. Uh, uh, amendments were passed to the Royal Commission Act of, 20, uh, uh, just trying to think when it was, probably 1901 or two um, for the, the establishing Royal Commissions. The private sessions were one-on-one -on -one sessions with a commissioner. They were not legal proceedings. It was just giving the person the opportunity to tell what happened to them. No More's involvement was again another first. It was the first time a legal service had been attached to a Royal Commission and the idea was that we would provide independent and free legal advice to everyone who came forward seeking that and it was about how to engage with the Royal Commission. It was a program of NACLAC and we started in July 2013 when the phones were turned on. And NACLAC is the National Association of Community, Community Legal, legal Centres. Thank yeah. you, yes. Yep. So Prue, as well as um, setting up the National Redress Scheme, which we'll talk more about today. Are there any other significant recommendations from the Royal Commission that would be useful for community workers to know about today? The, certainly there were, um, the, the Commissioner, the Chair of the Commission, Justice McClellan, was, was very concerned that he didn't want the report of the Royal Commission going into a bottom drawer and being left there. So he, he, he was quite smart in, in issuing the reports as during the life of the Royal Commission. Mm -hmm. So the first detailed report was the working with children check um, with the idea that there'd be uniform legislation around Australia for working with children and the checks that ne are needed. The other major one was the redress and civil litigation report that came out in September 2015. Um, and I won't go into the the technical points, but the main issues where civil litigation reform was indicated was the limitation periods or what we know is the statute of limitations, the ability to sue an institution. So a lot of the institutions were relying on property trusts saying that they mm. they didn't employ the priests and so mm. therefore you were suing the wrong person. That's been changed in some jurisdictions. Um, being able to um, identify the proper defendant and also that the institutions needed to adopt a model litigant guidelines. 
unfortunately, the state, while the states and territories have indicated they're, they're happy to look at all of those recommendations, they haven't been uniform in adopting them. So when someone comes to us for legal advice, it's really important that we find out which state they were abused in and then apply the, the legislation to that particular state. So the, the recommendations um, which came down in the report in December 2017, um, numbered 404, 99 mm -hmm. dealt with redress and civil litigation, 85 with criminal justice and 36 with working with children. Great, thanks Bruce. So now we will focus on the national redress uh, part of the recommendations. So what you can see on your screen now is the National Redress Scheme website and the web address is there if you want to find out more. Um, so Prue, I might ask you now to briefly explain what the National Redress Scheme is and um, yeah, and I guess NOMOR's role as well. Okay, so the National Redress Scheme was set up by the, by the Commonwealth Government and, and without wanting to be too technical, the Commonwealth doesn't have under the Constitution a head of power to enable it to establish a national redress scheme which would um, cover all of the states and institutions. It did rely on each state referring its powers un in, under relation, uh, in relation to um, establishing a redress scheme to the Commonwealth and that's been slow in happening though probably a little bit quicker than, than we would want in that the first two states, Victoria and New South Wales, have referred powers, and that was in May this year. We understand that Queensland and Tasmania will be referring powers from the 1st of November this year, mm -hmm. and Western Australia and South Australia early in 2019. So that was the first thing that had to happen. And territories need to do that as well? Um, look, in theory they don't, but in fact they are. So the ACT has referred powers mm -hmm. and they're waiting for the Northern Territory. So anyone who's been abused in a Commonwealth ACT, New South Wales or Victorian government institution can now apply for, for redress. And also there are some institutions that have indicated they will, will join and have been joined. And that's Scouts New South Wales, YMCA and the Salvation Army. So anyone abused in a state-based state, state government um, institution that I've named and in those institutions can now lodge an application for redress. So it's quite complex um, and again it's why we're encouraging people to get legal advice. The scheme started on the 1st of July um, and it will go for 10 years. Your application can't proceed unless the state where you were abused has joined and the institution in which you were abused has also joined. And we'll talk more later about the application process and when people should actually yeah. submit the applications. Great, thank you, Prue. Um, so you can see on your screen now the website for the No More Legal Service. So before we go into the details about the scheme, can you please explain what is No More and how you fit into the picture of the National Redress Scheme? Right. One of the recommendations of the Royal Commission was that there be a legal service set up to help people navigate through the redress scheme, but also to provide details of the compensation options that were available to people. This happened in February this year. We were very lucky to receive a substantial amount of money, which enabled us to continue no more and to expand no more. And so that in coming to no more, there's no means test and it is a national service. We have offices at present in Queensland, Sydney and it was, so Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne and we're anticipating opening an office in Perth next year um, and that, that will cover Australia in terms of being able to provide legal advice and assistance. For people in South Australia, we would, um, as we were with no more under the Royal Commission, legal advice and outreach will be offered from the Western Australian office and for people in Tasmania, the Victorian office will again do outreach into Tasmania and into Northern Territory, the people in the Brisbane office will be offering uh, outreach and legal advice there. So we, we are a truly national service. Um, the idea is that um, we have been, well, we've been funded to provide 
advice through the application process, especially once an offer has been received, because that's where there is the only time limit in the process that people have six months from the receipt of the offer to accept or reject it. So it's really important that we we are aware of that six month period and we provide advice mm -hmm. as to the options because once a, the deed of release is signed, when you've accepted the money from the redress, it does take away all of your common law rights to sue that responsible institution, which is a considerable right that people are giving up. So I think one of the key messages for this webinar today is to let community workers know to tell clients that they can get and should get free legal help if they're thinking about exactly. applying. Exactly. Addressing. And I know that No More is very busy uh, with the queries and advice. So is there a current wait time for advice? We, we, what we've done is we, we've um, triaged or prioritised clients. So contact, contacting our 1800 line there should not be any delay in, in getting through to an intake officer um, and, and they will take your details. If you've identified the client as being a priority client, so that's someone with a life-threatening illness or um, for mainstream stream clients, clients who have been born before 1938 or for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients, clients born before 1948, those clients can expect a call from the legal team where they've been allocated within one or two weeks of them call being made into intake. For other clients, we are struggling with numbers and we're looking at four to five weeks before they will get a call. And it is going to also depend if your state has joined the scheme and if the institution you are in has joined the scheme. But people who, who are ready in terms of those requirements will, will obviously be contacted as quickly as possible. We do have a few questions coming through about No More, so I might just ask those at this stage. Um, is No More for survivors of abuse generally or specifically for survivors of institutional child abuse, sex abuse? At, at this mm -hmm. stage, yeah. given the numbers that we're managing, it is only for people who've been um, survived, who are survivors of institutional child sexual abuse. Yeah. We're anticipating that long term No More will be a general legal service, but for child sexual abuse victims, mm -hmm. but right now we can't offer that service. But legal aid commissions, community legal centres yes, should exactly. be able to advise people who have um, oh, suffered okay. from abuse generally and what about the options. the options are. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and there's also a question around, do survivors need to contact financial counsellors or do you have financial counsellors in your service or how does that? One of our questions on intake is whether people uh, have, have financial hardship or owe debts because owe money to creditors because that's going to be quite significant once their monetary payment is received. Mm. We'll talk more about that later yeah, as well. Yeah. But we are exploring the possibility of bringing financial counsellors into our service. Great. And we'll talk a bit more about No More um, later on towards the end of the webinar about um, the social workers and how you yep. um, work with other people in your service. Thank you. All right, moving on to the details about the National Redress Scheme and who can apply. Um, Prue, I might ask you now to explain what are the, the conditions. So we've touched on it's not for any survivors of, of abuse, but for institutional abuse. So Yes, and, and the threshold to come into the scheme is that you need to have been sexually abused as a child within an institution you can, though, also claim the physical abuse and emotional and psychological abuse that you've suffered. There is within the framework allowance for that as well. Um, the monetary payment is capped at 150000 The average payment will probably be about 76000 So the redress scheme offers a monetary payment, counselling um, and psychological support and a direct personal response. Um, the abuse needs to have happened, as you can see on the screen, yeah. before... Um, July, this when it commenced, you do need to be an Australian citizen or permanent resident. And there's not to be any court ordered payment. You can have settled out of court, oh, okay. but any court ordered payment um, would mean that you can't apply. Um, we showed the National Redress Scheme website before. There's also some fact sheets, such as the one you can see on your screen on that um, website about who can apply, which goes into those details. 
Okay, and we will touch on the prisoners' um, situation a bit. We've had some questions around yes. that as well. Um, So I think you started talking about this a minute ago, but what does the redress scheme actually offer? So the, the, the payment? Yeah, yes, the, the, the payment. So the, the three things yeah. um, is the payment. When, and the important thing to remember about the payment is it is a reparation or a redress payment. It's not damages. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to take into account pain and suffering or loss of earnings. And a lot of clients are still asking for that. So it's really important that you're clear that it doesn't cover that. Um, it does offer access to counselling, which is going to depend on where you're living at this stage. Um, if there is no um, counsellor that's been nominated by the scheme in your area, then you will receive a monetary payment up to $5,000. That is um, attached to the nature of the abuse that re you received. So penetrative abuse is 5,000, contact is 2,500 and um, exposure is one, $1,250, which is a payment that you will receive on top of your monetary payment. No one will be following through as to if you've used that money for counselling. You will just get an, an additional payment. And the final part of this is a direct personal response, which um, is similar to an apology, but is, is it's more than that and it is entirely client focused so that the, the client can stipulate what, what they want. Um, and some clients have, have said, well, there's a, a library that it's been named after the perpetrator. I'd really like some assurance that that's going to change mm -hmm. um, and, and whether the institution is prepared to, to consider that. Um, incredibly, a lot of our clients really want to know that the institution is now child safe and they want some reassurance from the, the person who's doing the apology or the response that things have changed in that institution so that children going through that institution, whether it's Scouts or the local Catholic Church, will be safe. That, that's really the, what they want to see there. And just to clarify, there's no um, income or means test to get the payment no. for counselling? No. no. And um, just another question we've had is around um, if people have received a victim of crime compensation from their state in the past. I know in New South Wales it was up to $50,000 yeah. under victim's compensation in the past. So how does that interact? One of the questions, and I think it's question 50, 50 of the application form, people actually do need to declare the victim's compensation payment that they've received if it has related to that child sexual abuse. Mm. Um, it could be that you received money for something else, in which case you wouldn't have to declare it. Um, and the, the point then is that from the year that it was received up to the when you're lodging the application, it will be indexed at 1.9% per annum and deducted then from the assessed amount. So if you're assessed at $100,000 under the redress scheme, you've received $50,000 five years ago. That $50,000 as, as compensa, uh, victims of crime compensation will be indexed at 1.9% for the five years and that then will be deducted from the 100,000 that you've received. And there are, I know there are lots of other different payments people have. Yeah. Sometimes they've been class actions um, yes. against institutions. So how does that all uh, get a, it look like the same way? It does. And what we're encouraging people to do is where they've had a letter from the lawyer that sets out the amount of cost that the lawyer has charged in relation to that, whether it's a settlement that's been received or a class action, which the class action which was settled and there was not a... a judgment, it's important to make that mm. distinction, where the costs are clear from the letter from the lawyer, the costs will be um, deducted before the indexation takes into account. So that the scheme has made it quite clear they will not take into account the legal costs that have been paid. So I guess the message is yes, you generally do need to yep. declare these to things declare. and get legal advice about the specifics because that's important yep. to know. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Um, We've got some other questions around um, the impact uh, effect on Centrelink and if some people are bankrupt, but I think we might talk about that later when we talk about the financial implications yep. of the payment. So we might turn now to the situation for people sentenced to jail. And I guess there's 
uh, two things we'll be talking about. So on the one hand, it's whether if your client, person you're supporting is currently in jail, and the other situation is if they've ever been sentenced to five years. Or yes. More. Right. Yeah. So we'll talk about those two options now and clarify that because I know there's a bit of misconception in the community yeah. about the situation of people in jail. Yeah. Thanks. Bill. Um, so the first up, where you've got clients who are, are currently in jail and who are survivors of child sexual abuse, they are under the legislation. They are not able to apply for redress, and there's there's actually a couple of good reasons. They can't apply until they're released from from prison. The the reasons are that there's really not sufficient support within the the prison environment. Um, I don't know if you've looked at the application, but the the application form does require you to detail the nature of the abuse and the impact. Um, there is real concern that the prisoners doing this are, are themselves not, not safe, not well looked after once they start making these sorts of disclosures and, and digging down within their own being as to what happened to them. There's the fact that they're not safe. The other issue of concern is when it gets known within the prison community that someone is about to receive 150000 that makes them very vulnerable to all sorts of scamming going on within the prison. So what we're saying to prisoners, and we have a fact sheet on our website for prisoners, is that um, wait until you're released and give us a call. There are two exceptions to that. If you're dealing with a prisoner who is unwell and is likely to not um, be alive uh, by the time they, they are released from prison, then that would be regarded as a special circumstance in which they could make an application. The other circumstance is where you've got a prisoner, and unfortunately where prisoners have um, an extensive history of, of drug and alcohol abuse, their memory is going to be impaired. And you, you assess that it's unlikely in their release in say two years time, that they're not going to recall what happened to them or recall with sufficient clarity, then that would also be sufficient grounds to for a special um, circumstance application. And the other which doesn't concern us right now is um, if a prisoner is is still going to be in prison when the, the scheme comes to an end, um, and that would be 12 months from, uh, so that'd be 2027, 2027, then then they can apply. So that's for prisoners who are currently in prison. For people who've received a sentence of five or more years in jail, and that's not a cumulative sentence, and doesn't necessarily mean that the entire sentence that they've served, but they, that they received that sentence, they can complete the redress application form, but they will be asked to tick that they that has that relates to them. They will then receive another series of forms to complete, which relates to the nature of the offending, when it occurs, so how many years since they've offended, what rehabilitation they've undertaken, what their community uh, work and, and engagement has been, whether they've undertaken any employment, whether in a steady relationship. Um, that then is referred to, that information is referred to the Attorney General in the state where they were abused and the Attorney General in the state where they're incarcerated or were incarcerated. They then make a, a recommendation to the scheme operator. The scheme operator, and this unfortunately is not subject to review, looks at that information and decides whether allowing this person to proceed to make an application for redress would bring the scheme into disrepute or reduce public confidence in the scheme. Now, we're hoping that the decision in the negative won't, there won't be that too many of those decisions and that people will be allowed to continue to proceed with their application. Unfortunately, there's nothing in the legislation or the rules which enables a review to be made by of the decision by an operator to deny someone access to the scheme from that point. Um, thanks. For, and just to clarify, if someone has been in and out of jail and served short sentences of less than five years, it doesn't and apply to them. out of jail, it doesn't apply. No. So yeah. it's one sentence of five or more years. Yeah. And that can be in any state or territory in Australia or overseas. So it's a, a foreign yeah. jail system as well. And um, what if the situation is that the offender was sentenced for a child-related offence, but they were also a victim themselves? Mm. 
we, we don't know what the, the situation is going to be. Um, anecdotally, we've heard that there are a couple of um, people in prison um, who just, because of the horrendous nature of their offending against children, even though they themselves were um, offended against, are highly unlikely ever to be able to to access mm. this. But we, we're not getting the view that it's anyone who's been convicted of a sexual offence will be barred from the scheme. There's just a couple of notorious ones, um, and I think there's only one or two in Australia that they're particularly concerned about. But it's because the scheme is new. We don't know. We don't know the answers to some of these. No. And is this does this apply to youth detention as well? And I don't know of many long sentences of five years or more in youth detention. But does in theory, um, yeah, if, prison applies to yes, youth it, detention. It, yes, it does. And 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 let's hope there's nobody in that situation. Mm. Um, before we go on, we're going to test that you have been listening and do a quick poll. So I'm going to launch that now. So you can see on your screen, um, and you can only select one of these, which of the following is not offered by the National Redress Scheme? The payment of up to uh, $150,000, access to free counselling and psychological support, a direct personal response from the institution, or money for loss of income or pain and suffering because of trauma. Uh, just... Close that now, and I think, Prue, we can say that people have been listening. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> and we've got 96% um, of people said that the money for loss of income, pain and suffering because of trauma is what is not available. And a payment of up to uh, $150,000 is offered, but like we said, that not everyone no. is going to get that. No. Exactly. Great. Thank you for that, everyone. So hopefully, I, I think that section on um, the situation for people sentenced to jail was, did clarify a lot of questions people might have had. Um, so thanks for that. And what we're going to talk about now is something that might be relevant to community workers. And this might be something you haven't um, heard about. This hasn't been something that's been prominent in the, in the media, for example. So this is on redress nominees. So if you can please explain what is address nominee and how that is relevant for community workers, that would be great. Yeah, for sure. So there are two types of nominees under the scheme. The first is an assistance nominee, which will probably affect a lot of the community workers who are listening to the webinar. Um, and the other is a legal nominee. What you need to be careful of first is that a legal nominee is going to be someone um, either under financial management order or a power of attorney can actually make decisions for the person who's sitting opposite you and you need to ascertain if that's the situation before you proceed because it could be that the legal nominee is the person who should be talking to you and not mm. the person sitting opposite you. Um, we certainly won't be legal nominees for anyone um, and I would encourage you even if you're requested with someone on their their knees requesting that you be a legal nominee that you don't. There are uh, the public trustee is is someone that you would refer to if you and these are going to be circumstances where you uh, strongly believe the client hasn't got capacity um, or really doesn't understand what is going on that 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 is and early on set dementia is a real issue for us that that's when you think about a legal nominee being appointed but generally what we're talking about is an assistance nominee so that someone who's going to help um, complete, help the client complete the application, receive the letters and ask um, ask no more for questions uh, answers uh, about the redress process um, and you can also um, ask that the redress offer that be re reviewed. So if um, a community worker is asked to call no more on behalf of someone, would you only speak to them if they are an assistance nominee or? Look, no, we if, if the client is with you, and we would encourage that to be the case, we would ask you to step out of the the room. We could talk to the client and make sure that we've, we, we've got clear consent from the client for the uh, the assistance nominee or the community worker to come back in. Um, and, and then we would discuss the information. We really value the support that community workers provide to our clients, and I can't underestimate that. This is difficult for our clients and they often struggle 
with getting information, they often struggle to hear what we're saying and to have that second set of ears is really invaluable. So we would really encourage you to, when the client is with you, to phone us um, and for us to get consent from the person that you can stay and, and hear what we're saying to the person. Um, so I understand that some organisations have been funded to be redress support services. Is this the same as being a nominee or that's a separate It's issue? A, sep yeah. a separate issue, um, but I suspect the two will, will cross over. So the, the, I think they, they're called the redress support services, Rory, is that right? Yes. The yeah, RSS, uh, redress support services, <laughs> funded by the Department of Social Services to assist clients complete the application forms. As, as with us, a lot of clients are going to need assistance and we'll appoint those people as assistance nominees. My only concern for, for people or community organisations doing that, just remember that there is that six month period when the client must accept or reject the offer when it's made and it may well come to your office. Um, if the client does nothing, it's taken to have been rejected and you cannot make another application. So what my tip would be, if you're going to be an assistance nominee, make sure you have plenty of other contact people and numbers for your client should you lose contact with them. Because the last thing you want is for that um, offer to lapse because you can't find the client. And even if you are an assistance nominee or a legal nominee, the individual should still get legal advice yes. no more as well. Yes. Separate. Yeah. Yeah. Or even if they're getting help from the redress support service, they should still get the legal yeah. advice, definitely. Um, we've got another question before we move on to the financial implications for payment under the scheme, just in terms of um, being able to apply under the scheme. There's no, if someone hasn't made a complaint to police, for example, they're still elig eligible to apply under the redress scheme. Yeah. yeah, and what I should, probably should have said early on is that the, the standard of proof for the redress scheme is reasonable likelihood. So it's much, much lower than the civil standard of balanced probabilities. So it's more likely than that or that it's more plausible that this happened than didn't happen. Um, and what we're also finding is while there's um, a provision in the application form for the to supply records, a lot of institutions have suddenly had fires and floods and there are no records, mm -hmm. so that they do have to rigorously apply more likely than not that it happened to you. Okay, we'll move on now to the financial implications of a payment under the scheme. Um, so I think that's really important that there have been some questions already. So, um, We've heard that the monetary payment is, is one of the, um, what will be offered under the scheme and it can be a, quite a lot of money. So what should clients do? I guess it's about seeking legal advice before applying, but what um, are the financial implications? The, the Commonwealth has been quite careful to quarantine as much as possible the the payment so that it is a recognition payment for the what's happened to the person um, and to the best of their ability they have set up legislation to ensure that it's quarantined so the it's it's not going to be subjected to any to payment of any commonwealth debt so that there's centrelink debt if there's a child support debt if there's an ato debt the money that's come through from redress will not be used to pay that debt it will not be income tested, um, but it will be an asset. So it's really important that people do contact Centrelink to let them know. We've done a bit of modelling and we think even with the deeming provisions that there will it's very, very unlikely there'll be any impact as an asset on a Centrelink payment. One of the reasons we're asking people about whether they have any debts when they first come to us is that generally what's happened to you in terms of child sexual abuse should be enough for a hardship application to be lodged so that you can waive those debts before we even get to the payment coming through and that would be the, the best option available. Having said that, I'm still in negotiation with the major banks to see what we can do to quarantine payments from paying off a personal debt or credit card debt. Um, and I think we're, we're going to get there on that. And we also want to pick up telcos and utility providers. So we're doing the best that we can 
to quarantine these payments from the payment of debt. Okay, we might move on just because um, we just looked at the time. Um, we've got a short case study that I'll just read out quickly and we'll go through that. Um, so this is a typical client, I guess. Of, yes, of it is. Yes. yes. So John was groomed and sexually abused in a Catholic parish over three years in the late 1960s. The trauma of this experience led to a breakdown in the 1980s and John resigned from his job in the public service. Since then, John has struggled financially. He received the disability support pension, owes $80,000 on his mortgage, as well as $7,000 for an old credit card debt. John has managed to make minimal payments on his mortgage, but it's always a struggle. His assets are the house, valued at $280,000, and his superannuation balance of $30,000. John is 62, he's single and lives in rural New South Wales. His younger brother lives nearby and seems to be taking an active interest in the progress of John's redress payment. After John made a claim under the redress scheme, he was awarded $100,000. John was distressed that the amount of redress wasn't higher um, as he saw the abuse he experienced and the impact it had on him as deserving of the maximum amount. So the questions now, and I'll just have uh, launched the quick poll question, and it, the questions are, what are the issues? So I guess if John was your client, what issues would you identify for him? And you can um, tick more than one there. So the impact of the redress payment on his Centrelink income, his outstanding credit card and mortgage debts, his younger brother's interest in the redress payment, and the application for review on his redress determination. So what are the issues? And I'm just going to close that now in the interest of time and share that with you all. So thank you very much. So, Prue, we've got, um, I guess all the issues are identified. 54% of people think that the Centrelink is an issue um, and sort of 80, 90% of people um, agree that all the other <laughs> others are issues for John. So do you, do you want, want to talk about yeah, that? Yes. Yeah. So certainly when we're talking about the, the Centrelink, it's important that um, John notifies Centrelink of the payment that he's received. It's un unlikely that it's going to impact his assets um, or reduce his, his Centrelink payments because of the impact on his assets. Um, he certainly should make an application for um, the under the hardship program for partial waiver of the, the debts that he's owing for mortgage and credit card. And we would ideally begin that process way before he received the, the financial payment of um, $100,000. We are very often seeing interest of children in their parents, um, applications for redress, so elder abuse is really on our radar mm -hmm. and we're making sure that we have good referral pathways to the, the um, Seniors Rights Legal Services. The application for review, my concern there, and it was something that we raised in a joint Senate hearing couple of weeks ago, the redress legislation doesn't allow for the fact that if you make a review, a request for review, you will be in no worse off position. Mm -hmm. So what we'd really like is that even if he lodges an application for a review, that he can only improve and not drop. What we don't want to see is that it's reviewed at $60,000 and Unfortunately, a lot of people aren't aware of the situation when you do a review, you have to cop whatever the, the second decision is. You can't go back and say, well, I don't like that decision. I'll take the first one. Thanks very much. Um, unfortunately, the law doesn't work that way and you will have to take the second decision, whether it's better or worse. We have been advocating and lobbying that the person, when they make a review application, be in no worse position than they are when they've requested that review. And I guess, again, the message is to get legal advice, legal advice. because people yeah. might, may not know about that. So we've got here some key points about the National Address Scheme that I know um, Prue and Rory from No More Want to, to get across to as many people as possible. Um, so if you just want to take people through these key points, takeaway points from today, that'd be great. Yeah. And then we'll talk a bit more about No More, because I know some people have had questions about your intake and that kind of thing. Yeah. So we'll go to that in a minute. Yeah. Um, so just the, the take home points is um, not all institutions or states have joined the scheme, but keep an eye on that because we know on the 1st of November, Queensland and Tasmania will be joining. 
um, it's the best thing to see which institutions have joined the scheme is actually to go to the National Redress website where there's a, 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 like a button. Subscribe. Yeah, you can subscribe, but there's also a button that you can just click on and then type in the name of the institution and that will come up as to whether or not it's in. So as I've said, the YMCA and Scouts and Salvation Army are in already. The scheme does run for 10 years, so it's important to manage your clients' expectations, that they do have time to take a deep breath, get some legal advice as to whether they've got a viable common law claim, um, and, it, and just to, to explore that before they, they lodge their application for redress. People who are unwell should really move as quickly as possible, bearing in mind that once a completed application has been lodged with the redress scheme, even if the person should die during the process, the application will be processed and the monetary payment will be paid to that person's estate. So that's important to be aware of that. And also to be aware that redress does comprise those three components of monetary payment, access to counselling and a direct personal response if the person wants it. But also bear in mind that even if you're abused in many institutions, you can only make one application, picking up all of the institutions and that time limit, which is vital, six months from the date of the determination. I'm going to do one more quick poll, so I know we are short of time now, but I guess this is just to clarify for workers, what are the key messages that you should be telling the people you support? So if someone asks you to support them for a through the National Dress Scheme, what would you tell them? Would you tell them the, the, the website is there, which lists the participating institutions? Would you tell them the scheme goes for 10 years, so there's no rush to apply if you're well? Uh, would you tell them you can only apply now if you're in New South Wales or Victoria? And would you tell them it's a good idea to get free legal advice from No More first? I'll, thank you, everyone. I'll just close that now and share the poll. So, Prue, you'll be very happy to hear that 100% of people think it's a good idea to get free legal advice first. From Excellent. No More. <laughs> <laughs> My job is done. Um, so, 28% some of people have said you can only apply now if you're in New South Wales and Victoria. So maybe it's a good opportunity to just clarify that. Okay. Issue. So the, the issue is um, New South Wales, Victoria, the ACT and Commonwealth, if you're abused in the institutions for those governments plus YMCA, Scouts and Salvation Army in those states and territory, you can apply now. But we're anticipating on the 1st of November, we'll pick up Queensland and Tasmania. So if someone was abused in a uh, South Australian institute, run institution, for example, should they be submitting the application or holding off? Look, or there's nothing to stop you submitting an application. But our view at this stage is just to hold until your state has joined and then your institution has joined. So the only people who really need to progress quickly are people who have got a life life threatening illness, really and truly. Everyone else can just take a deep breath, um, get good legal advice and then decide if that's the way they should be going. Yeah. And um, our oh, South Australian government, did you mention that was expected Look, early We next are year, expected them, yeah. 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 that poll now. So in the sort of 10 minutes we've got left, I think this is a really important point. So we'll just talk about that, then we'll talk about the issues around um, No More itself and the your intake. So the legal implications of this scheme and what are other options? Yeah. So the, the biggest issue is that people will be asked to sign a statutory release or a deed of release. That will then mean any proceedings that you've commenced or want to begin against the responsible institution must stop. So you are giving up considerable rights by signing that statutory release and client, clients must know that. When the letter goes out to the client with the award or the, the determination, they are told this and they are told to seek legal advice from, from no more. So it's important that you re reinforce that, that they are giving up legal rights and they should get legal advice before they do that. And it's at the point of accepting the 
award rather than application process. Yeah. yeah. Look, ideally, when people come to us, first up, we can give them the range of options so that when they come back with the, the offer, we will have already gone through what the options are, whether or not it's it's likely or, or not. We'll have a look at the amount that they've offered, been offered, and we can provide advice as to whether or not that looks as if it's an offer that they should be accepting. Mm -hmm. And you will be able to advise people on the other options, like whether they should go through the redress scheme or civil litigation. Um, we had some questions in the past about does it depend on whether the perpetrator is deceased or what, how much evidence was in available. terms of the redress yeah, or, or how option. people would select which option to go with? The um, look, they're both really good questions and yeah. it's going to be um, an each case on its merits. Yeah. But can I just give a bit of a warning? Some of our letters that are going out with the various options are quite long letters and we mm -hmm. would value your support in helping clients go through those letters. Um, there, there will be one letter that sets out all of those options and it's, we try to put it in as plain English as possible, but they are quite complex letters and quite complex ideas that we're trying to get across and we value your support in helping clients go through those letters. So we've got a question that someone can't start a civil proceedings for pain and suffering as well as applying under the they, address scheme. They, they can do both but at some point they have to decide. So it could be for a lot of our clients that doing the civil litigation process is just too traumatic and they just can't continue with the process so that they would then keep going with redress. But the the thing that you really must bear in mind is you go down redress, you get the offer, you accept the offer, that immediately ends the civil litigation that you could have mm. done against that responsible institution. Okay. And there's other options such as some institutions have their own internal redress scheme. That's right. right. Uh, and they still some some institutions have indicated they're going to close those, mm -hmm. but some are not, and they're they're prepared to continue. So, it, 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 again, it's case by case, and which which state you're in, which institution it is. Yep. And again, the main message is just to get legal advice. Just first. just yep. give us a call. Great. Um. So I think uh, it's also important. Oops. One there. It's also important to to clarify that no more no more does provide specialist trauma informed support. So I guess maybe this is a question for Rory. So what does that mean for no more? And do you have any tips you can give to community workers who are helping people through the redress scheme? How can they also provide trauma informed support? And I know that that could be a whole <laughs> one hour webinar in itself. So yeah. just a few words, I suppose. No, absolutely. I think um, just just briefly, even though I'm sure that many services do work from a, <clears throat> a trauma informed um, framework, the, the five key elements to that are ensuring, you know, safety for clients, transparency and trustworthiness, choice, uh, collaboration and mutual, mutuality, mutuality and empowerment. I guess um, that's that's just the key five um, from reform principles that we work from. But what's probably important to know about No More and our um, our business or organisational structure is that we, yes, we're a legal service and we have lawyers that can provide this legal advice, but we are multidisciplinary and we have uh, social workers and counsellors that are available to sit alongside or assist clients, say, in between the receiving of legal advice or during the um, kind of statement taking and or application process um, that can, you know, so that support can be given. We've also got an Aboriginal engagement team who are also available so they can support clients throughout their, I guess, their, their accessing of our service. Um, we work with clients to ensure, you know, safety is key. We, you know, we work from a position of ensuring that we don't cause any further harm. You know, it's our aim to not re-traumatise um, clients and of course, like I said before, safety is key. So whilst we have got those services in-house and we can provide um, support to, to these clients, we will also be assisting people who come to the service who may not be linked within um, other services like the people that are um, listening into the webinar, the community workers, we will assist clients where we can if they aren't um, being assisted by external services if that's what they want. So make referrals to counselling, support services, community services, mental health services, yeah, where where we're needed and, and we're requested. Um, yeah, that's probably, that's the, uh, you know, that's a, 
we just want to make sure that we can provide as much of a wraparound service as we can. So, and just to ensure that people are understanding um, and are grasping what it is that we're giving them as far as the legal information and advice. And, you know, so that, yes, the legal advice and support is being given by the lawyers, but can also be, um, you know, people can be followed up by a counsellor um, and maybe talk through some of that stuff further if it's not completely understood or, can sometimes the councillors can act as a go-between if, if necessary, as does the Aboriginal engagement team. Great, thank you. Um, we might just quickly talk about no more, just so people will get a, a picture about it, and then we've already started to get lots of questions in, so um, we'll go to those in a minute. So um, you can see on your screen the number of people you have working at no more. So um, you've got lawyers and paralegals, uh, 32 lawyers and paralegals, social workers and counsellors, as Rory just mentioned, as well as the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander engagement advisors and intake and client services staff. So that, that those yeah. staff are across the, our three offices. So they, they're in Sydney, um, Melbourne and Brisbane. And uh, one question we had before around no more is that you mentioned, I think, that it can take a few weeks for someone to get a call back. So how does that work with you want the community workers to be present sometimes with the, the client to assist them through. So in a practical way, if it's a call back that amount of time later, what do you suggest? Like, do you arrange to call someone back at a time that suits them? Or? Look, we try and be as flexible yeah. as we can yeah. and work to each person's kind of needs and circumstances. The intake um, process is, yeah, we work with the client on what, what they're up to um, up to at that time of intake. And it may be that a client, you know, speaks to the intake team, but it, it it's better that they come back to us for that intake with their support or, or community worker. And we'll, we'll ensure that we get all of those um, authorities through to, to allow us to do that in the way that suits the client or is best, um, best works within, yeah, their, their own needs. Um, what would happen is after intake and after the gathering of that initial information we would kind of talk to the client about what supports they've got available try and like I said before link them into other services that might be available to to kind of hold them or provide support to them between that yeah. initial contact and the and the legal follow-up we'll also if they would like to hear from our social work counseling team or the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander engagement advisors in between or in that gap of time we can um, facilitate that that might just help them to become a little more familiar with the service and have a point of contact between the initial contact and the giving of the legal the initial legal advice we've got paralegal staff who uh, will contact people within that kind of four to five week period and set up appointments for people um, and what that looks like will very much depend on what the client says they need around that initial appointment whether it be face to face whether it is with their support worker or whether it's with one of our um, counseling or engagement staff so we try and hold them as best we can, um, but also keeping in, in mind the, the volume that, that is there. So that's where we will tap into the community workers that we were speaking to today. Great, yeah. thanks, Sherry. Um, this is just to give you some information about the, the clients of No More, but I might just leave that there and you can um, access those things on the No More yeah. website as that's well. Right. So priority um, clients. Um, as well, this is just for, for information to show that um, where the clients come from, how many, how busy you are at the moment. Yeah. Is there anything you wanted to say? Look, look just about? those number of clients yes. are since the 2nd of July, and I think yeah. we've now passed 2,600 clients. Yeah. 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 Thank you. And the contact number, again, as I mentioned, that will be in the email you'll get at the end of the webinar. Um, but that's just the no more contact details. So you can take those down and they will also be in the email you'll get. Um, the website, we've got lots of questions coming in. Um, the redress support services, you can find those on the National Redress website. Yes. And on the no more website, you can find lots more fact sheets. So you can see on the screen there, there's lots of fact sheets about different ways of um, getting the victim's compensation in each state. And there's an additional fact sheet about prisoners. Great. That okay. have so been there's, put on. Yeah, look for the fact sheets there. There's plenty of information. And as I said, the links um, are there. The web address is there too. These are the two main contacts from today. Yes. No more, the website and the 1-800 number. 
1800 And on that uh, 1800 number, you would um, initially speak to an intake worker. Great, thank you. And the National Redress Scheme, and uh, it's got there, that includes the contacts for the redress support yes, services. Yeah. You can find yeah. those on that website. And they have a 1800 number as well. So they're the main contacts for today. Um, if the question is more broadly about abuse, not specifically institutional child sexual abuse, then definitely you can also contact the legal aid yes. commissions or community legal centres in your yep. local areas. Yeah, definitely. Um, key takeaway messages for today, and then we will go on to your questions. Obviously, there is a national redress scheme for people who experience institutional child sexual abuse. Um, as Prue said before, we want you to be able to manage the expectations of the people you support that the scheme will run for 10 years, so there's no urgency unless you're... Um, Unwell. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And that time limit is really important. Yes. So that's once you've received a t determination. Yes. For six you can, months. You can only make one application. Yep. So even if you do not respond, it's taken you've rejected it and you mm. cannot make another application. Yes and send people to know more but keeping in mind that point number two yes please <laughs> inundated great okay um so that's the end of our uh webinar today and we're a few minutes over time but not too bad um we've got no more's number again on the screen there for you as well as our an email address cle at legalaid.nsw.gov.au. Um, if you're watching a recorded version of this webinar, feel free to email us if you have any questions and we can pass those on to know more. Um, so thank you everyone very much for tuning in today and for your participation. Um, we are staying online for a few, I know we are just ticked over the hour now, but there was a lot to cover and we really appreciate the expertise of Prue and Rory coming in today and I think um, everyone really valued and appreciated your expertise. Well, and, it's and it's lovely to have this opportunity, thank you. Yeah, thank especially you. after coming back from Canberra yesterday, yesterday. with a yeah. national apology. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Um, there are lots of questions already so I'm going to go through those as best we can and if you have any more questions uh, we are staying online for a while and we'll try and answer them. Okay, so bear with me. Um, so I think we've answered questions around um, the callbacks and, and no more and how you can get it. I guess people are saying they... So clients, are, when they're asked to do intake at no more, um, I guess how do you manage that the anxiety of people having to retell their stories? But I think Rory, you answered that before around. Um, I think what point. we do is tr we look. It is case by case. Mm -hmm. We also um, ensure that there is always counselling support available if during intakes there's someone becomes quite distressed and does need that um, support. We take it at a you know we we pace intake um, depending on how the client's presenting. We also if it's not the right time for an intake to occur we won't it's not you know we don't we don't push that. Um, we work with the client to to you know work with them around what is best for them. We prepare them. There are some questions that are you know, a couple of the questions are difficult. They're difficult mm -hmm. questions to answer, but um, they, they are, it's information that is important to ensuring we provide them with the best and most appropriate advice. So um, we prepare them as best as possible um, for the fact that we will ask questions around their experiences of abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, you know, it's about, again, case by case, you know, looking at whether or not the client is ready for that process at that time and making arrangements for follow-up if it isn't, um, follow-up if just they become distressed at the time but feel that they'll need to be checked in upon by a counsellor. Um, yeah, we, we, I, I feel that we do it very carefully. Mm. Um, we've got some questions uh, more specifically around that uh, civil litigation angle. So if a person has commenced civil litigation and they've got a private law firm assisting them, um, 
sorry, I don't understand. If, they, if that law firm advises that they can't take the case any further, is that private law firm then entitled to, ooh, I'm sorry, I'm not reading this out very well, but I think the question is, if I um, paraphrase it, is there payment if a, yeah. someone goes to a private lawyer mm. to apply under the National mm. Redress Scheme, does that lawyer have a payment available? Look, this, this is a really yeah. difficult issue and we are developing a fact sheet that we will distribute to people and put on our website. It is a really difficult issue because a, most of the law firms doing this work are doing it on a conditional or no win, no fee basis. That means that they're delaying their costs until there's a successful outcome. What we are concerned about is if the client changes from civil litigation across to redress and receives an amount of money, that amount of money will be seen as a successful outcome, mm -hmm. which will then trigger the payment of those legal costs that have been incurred. Now, we're in the process of talking, as, as most people know, that we, we have a panel of lawyers that we refer our clients to. Some of our panel lawyers have said, we won't charge those costs, we will wear those costs. Some are saying that if the client is in receipt of a Centrelink benefit, then they won't seek to recover those costs. Other firms which, who are smaller are saying, we can't afford not to charge those costs. So it, look, it is case by case. You will need to go and have a look at the client agreement or the costs agreement that the client signed up when they first went to see that panel lawyer or that lawyer, that private lawyer, see what it is, the, the how they've defined successful outcome. Uh, and that, that is a real live issue and we will certainly help you um, negotiate the, those those issues with, with the person who's sitting with you. So keep an eye out on the No, no More website. Yes, there, there will be a fact sheet coming. Yeah, great. Um, so can someone lodge a claim if the sexual abuse in the institution was perpetrated by another child and they, yes. they disclosed to the organisation but yes. were believed. Yes. Look, there are um, regulations about peer-on-peer -peer abuse. Initially, the thought was that it would be excluded, mm -hmm. but it hasn't been. It is there um, and there are regulations around it, but generally um, you can make an application when Thank it's peer-on-peer -peer abuse. Yeah, there, have, there were a couple of questions about that, so mm. I think that might be an issue, so thanks for that. Um, a question about the deed of release. Um, does that, so that's around, um, it doesn't release the organisation from any, um, what's the word? Sorry, I'm not sure. Um, when the deed of release, does that include releasing the institution from responsibility for for the abuse or anything like that, or it's just about somebody not being able to continue with or start civil proceedings? But, well, it's, 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 a, like, it's a normal deed of release, yeah. so so that would actually release the institution from any any responsibility to have to pay any further amount of money to you for what's happened. It doesn't release the perpetrator, mm -hmm. which is very important to realise. It could be that the perpetrator still has, um, you know, if they're a teacher and they've, they've got a house, that they've got assets, um, that you could you can still bring a civil action against that perpetrator. Um, so it's only the institution, the responsible institution in your application who will be released from any further liability to pay you any um, compensation. That's good to know. And obviously it uh, people can still pursue criminal actions yes. against the perpetrator themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, well, yeah, the, the police have to investigate. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about do people need to pay tax on the... No, because it's not, it's not regarded as income. So it's not income tested. Um, so there's no tax payable on it. Um, and so just to clarify again, what if an institution or organisation doesn't register with the redress mm. scheme at all? Mm. And look, we have real concerns about, in particular, the Jehovah's Witnesses who have mm. pretty well thumbed their noses at the Royal Commission and continue to say this is um, something that doesn't relate to them when it clearly mm. does. What the Department of Social Services, so the Department of Social Services is doing the policy behind this scheme. What they've indicated is that where they get claims coming in from a particular institution and that institution hasn't joined, they will write to the institution and say, we've got 
you know, six claims against Jehovah's Witnesses, um, we strongly encourage you to join the scheme. I'm also pretty sure there's going to be some publicity around naming and shaming institutions who don't join. So again, it's about getting legal Look, keep, yeah, get legal advice, <laughs> yeah. but also keep um, an eye on the National Redress Scheme um, website and the institutions that have joined. Um, there was one comment earlier on, this is just an, an aside and a plug, that um, my face, Natalie's face, wasn't view, wasn't seen on the <laughs> webcam. So, um, and what how I will respond to that is you should watch our next webinar and we'll try the <laughs> webcam again and then you can see me. So, um, law, as I mentioned, Law for Community Workers um, by Legal Aid New South Wales, we have different um, webinars on lots of different topics and, um, yeah, that's the CLE branch here at Legal Aid is uh, very happy to have you join us today. And we have an, an alert that I think the link will be in the email as well. So sign up to our alert to find out what webinars are coming up next. Um, I'm just conscious of time. We've um, kept people for, for 15 minutes beyond what we said. There are a few more questions, Prue. I, if you are happy to, to stay for another couple of minutes. Yes, I'm happy to I'll read it. those out. I understand that um, many of you can't can't stay on, but um, we still have quite a few people still listening, so I think they yeah. are still really interested and people are asking really great yeah, questions. Yeah, no, no, the questions are fantastic. Um, there will also be a recording of this webinar on the Legal Aid uh, YouTube channel, so um, if you sign up to the alerts, you'll be um, notified when that recording is up. Right. Um, so, what more questions about, um, well, great. Do you know if, um, if support workers or community workers, do they usually have, a, or do you require them to have an authority to speak to you on behalf of a client, like a signed authority or? So if the client's not there yeah. to physically give consent, so we ask that the yeah. support worker work out, walk out of the room, We speak yep. to the client, they consent, but if that's not going to be the case, yes, we will need a signed authority to talk to the person, to their support worker. Or they've signed up as a redress nominee. That, that is separate. for the Department of ah, okay. Human Services, right. that's not us. Right. So okay. th they would need to have a separate consent to speak to us. Great, yeah. thanks for clarifying that. Um, there is Oh, there was a question around um, financial implications. If if the recipient is bankrupt mm -hmm. and they've received a payment, how are funds taken from that to pay creditors? No. Mm -hmm. So again, this is covered in the legislation that bankruptcy um, will that any claims under bankruptcy can't be taken out of the the monetary payment that's made under redress. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. We've got a question, I think, from a financial counsellor saying that they are already under, they already have a lot of work, huge um, demand from clients, but there's no additional funding for financial counsellors, but they've got such a big role. Yes, in this. exactly. We, we are doing a lot of advocacy work around this particular issue because it's a real concern yeah. to us. Um, we don't want the clients losing their money mm. um, to creditors, and so we're, we, really do see the importance of having financial counsellors on board to help us with this work. So if financial counsellors want to support that advocacy, they can contact, yep. contact you? Yes. Yep. Um, so there was a question around, you might have answered this before in relation to the Jehovah's Witness comment, but if an organisation does not want to join the scheme, can they be required to join, forced to join? No, it's, it's shame, naming and shaming. Mm -hmm. um, it's, if, if, you're, if the institution where the person was abused hasn't joined the scheme, the, the only thing that I could say is where you've got a defunct organisation, so, and this is generally going to be the local, a small organisation such as the local cricket club, there's a possibility of a funder of last resort. Again, we've, we've uh, voiced our concerns with this because the funder of last resort is, uh, so that's the government picking up the tab, but that mm -hmm. can only happen where there's been shared responsibility. So what you would need to, and we're becoming quite forensic in our, our searching, is that the local cricket club would have needed to have received money from the state or federal government. 
um, and, and then be reporting to that government about the funding for us to begin to say there may be some shared responsibility. If there's not, and the cricket club has, hasn't got the assets and won't be joining the scheme, then unfortunately those people have no, there's nothing available for them. Um, look, I think we've covered most of the questions. Sorry, no, one more here. Um, uh, what, how, oh, sorry, what other methods are available for people in regional remote areas or pe people with a disability to speak to know more? What options do you have in terms of, I guess, face-to-face -face or Skype for people who can't access Certainly it? Skype. Skype. Yeah. Um, we will be doing outreach um, and, and that's we will be doing that in early next year where we'll go to a lot of the the uh, rural and regional and remote communities where we'll do basically a public forum at night mm. and the next day we'll, we'll, we'll probably be there in for two or three days and we'll run clinics and take do applications and provide legal advice. Yeah, so I guess it's very important for us to hear from people who yeah. you know, are in those regional and remote areas and specifically would need a face-to-face -face appointment yeah. if that's, that's Absolutely. what's going to work best and we can, and, and we can consider tailor, that. Yeah, yeah, tailor yeah. what we're doing to that. Great, and those outreach um, services will be uh, promoted on your website? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay, well, I think we might leave it there. Do feel free to email any further questions to the CLE at legalaid.nsw.gov.au and we can um, pass those on to Prue and Rory. So thank you again very much. Oh, well, to thank you me. everyone for, for staying yeah, on and, and for thank you. participating. Thanks very much, everyone. And um, there will be the recorded webinar, so do feel free to tell your colleagues about that when that comes through. Thank you, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thanks, everyone.